Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I am the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Exploration and Analytics for the Modern Business, sponsored today by Looker. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Joining us today are Greg Jones and Scott Hoover. Greg is a lead developer at SmartLing, where he is responsible for reporting and, and analytics, as well as for the SmartLing API that enables access to SmartLing trans, uh, translation functionality from other applications. Prior to SmartLing, Greg was lead software d uh, engineer at theLadders.com, a leading mobile career network, and served in various management and consulting roles in the software development realm. Scott is a data scientist on the Looker implementation team where he helps clients build models of their business data and has authored SDKs that extend Looker's functionality through its API. Before joining Looker, Scott worked as a statistician in academia and later consulting. And with that, I will give the floor to Scott to start the presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, again, this is Scott Hoover. Uh, I work at Looker on the analytics team. Uh, it is a, a business intelligence software, uh, and, and more to the point, it's a, it's a data exploration solution that operates in database, and it enables organizations to explore data in all of its detail. Looker has about 100 clients uh, at present, uh, which one is SmartLing, uh, and they were going to be hearing about the, uh, you know, the UK SmartLing uh, has uh, in, with respect to Looker. Uh, and so I'm just going to turn it over to Greg Jones, who's their lead developer at SmartLink. Greg? Thank you. All right. So I'm going to talk about data exploration and how we're doing at SmartLink. Uh, I'm one of the lead engineers at SmartLink. I'm in charge of the reporting analytics as well as the API. Uh, let's see. About SmartLink. So we're a translation management platform. Uh, we enable companies to bring the content to an international audience. Um, we essentially, we want to speed up the time to market it takes for a client to, to bring content out to the rest of the world. And you do that for a number of different pieces of content, whether that is your mobile applications, your dashboard, uh, your marketing website, um, any business documents that uh, you may have. We may have any number of ways that we can take content transmit and get it back to the end client and eventually the, the users of your, um, your, sec, your system. Works. First, we have an API to get content in. So if you have and XML files or iOS string files, or files in any, basically any kind of content, we, can, we have an API to allow that content in. We also support Adobe uh, various CMSs such as Adobe CQ, Sitecore, Drupal, and all these enable clients to bring content into SmartLink where we could translate it. Focus on professional translation. We do allow machine translation, but are to provide great, timely, quality translations, and we get that best with human translations. And at the end, we're going to deliver the content back to our clients uh, in its translated form. One aspect of our business is something we call the global delivery network. This is a way where we can enable clients to cut down, drastically cut down, the time to market that takes to bring content uh, to an international audience. Uh, SurveyMonkey is a customer of ours, and we actually have their site um, in uh, German, French, and Spanish, and numerous other languages. And we do it through what is known as a proxy, in which requests for, let's say, a Spanish site, um, um, survey would come in. We make to the original SurveyMonkey get that content. Um, in English, parse it, look up the translations that have been provided by our human translators, and return that translated content back, back in all about uh, uh, a number of milliseconds. So we can do this and drastically cut down the time to market. So instead of something taking up of a year or two years to actually go and redevelop your site, your application, to get it to an international audience, we can do that in a matter of weeks with little to no development required. 
have a number of uh, data needs. So we want to provide uh, translations back to our clients within a 48-hour time period. That's the SLA that we strive for. Uh, so to do that, we need to constantly be monitoring and looking into how well is our translation workflow working. Quickly, our translators translated the content. How quickly move it to the next step? How how quickly um, are the views and the edits taking place on it before it eventually gets published? And we look at that across a number of different ways. We want to look with it for a customer, um, for a given language, for an agency who's working with us. Um, there's many ways we have to slice and dice the data. And I'm going to give our visitors control over that data. We want them to be able to look at the data and get the data out that they need. Um, I do this while reducing development time. Furthermore, we also want to provo provide a single view of the data. Um, before kind of embarking on this, it would be up to a developer to come up with his own query about how this data would look, and or a business user writing their own SQL to get this data, and they can get different results. So we want to provide one centralized view definition of what this data is. So some of the technical uh, needs and uh, challenges that we have. So uh, we have an enormous amount of volume. Um, we serve upwards of 3 billion page views a month. Um, there's 84,000 metrics for challenge that we're, we're monitoring at any given time. There, there's a huge amount of data, and we need to process that data and do it in a quick and efficient timeline. Um, we also have our data spread across three different databases. Joining that data at first was problematic. Um, we also have a, we want a simple API to add that data without having to go through a lot of development work to get it. So that, first, we used Amazon Redshift as our data warehouse. We it as a copy or a replica of our transactional data. We store it there nightly. And what we found with Redshift is that, that it's an extremely high format database. Uh, the query would uh, take hours to run in our SQL would take um, seconds to run in Redshift. We also decided to use Looker for our exploration platform. We found that they were a great way to get in front of the, front of the business users and let them be, get to the data that they need. Looker, um, well, first, strong lined with smartly principles continually to improve their product and deploy new features. They're a web company, so everything is done in the web. There's no um, console applications to install. And they made things incredibly easy to do. Um, in looking, working with Looker, the support is excellent. Uh, it just takes a matter of seconds to get uh, in touch with them and to be able to resolve the problems. And they were extremely easy to use. Um, a number of our developers have built out models using Looker, as Scott will uh, demonstrate later. And then our CTO, uh, who hadn't done much development work uh, lately, was even able to build a report in Looker. As I mentioned, uh, one of the things we wanted to look at was how well our translation is moving through the system. To be able to analyze our workflow and our velocity, how quickly things move that workflow, identify bottlenecks. Um, we wanted to see that because we want we have an SLA that we want to maintain. We want to make sure that if that is not happening, if that is not occurring, that our clients are able to recoup money in such a case. So, how Smartly is improving the process? If we weren't using Smartly, a lot of times a, a four dollar turnaround would not occur. So, we want to show that Smartly is able to speed up the process. A uh, sample report that is taken um, out of Looker. This is translation velocity, how quick strings were able to move from approved, get translated, go through a two-step review process, and eventually be published. Um, as you can see, there's a number of languages um, for this particular client. We were able to um, meet our 48-hour SLA, um, sometimes well before the 40 hours even up. The two languages that, while they didn't quite meet the SLA, um, they were just a few hours over. And there were six languages in which um, the 40-hour turnaround did not occur, and even one language, Turkish here, that far exceeded what we consider acceptable.
acceptable time frame for turnaround translations. So this is an indicator to our, our business users that there's some issue here. It needs to be looked at to find why are things taking too long? Is this that there's, any, there's not enough context for a translation and therefore things are slower translation process? Are there issues being raised that are not addressed? They're going on here that need to be evaluated. And right now we don't have the ability to go and look into the details of that, but that's something we'll be providing uh, down the road. But this is a first step in identifying that there's a problem here. We need to do something to correct that. So an aspect of business um, is we want to see how well we're leveraging translation memory. And I'll explain that a bit. When the text is translated, we store that text uh, in SmartLink to serve a translation but we store it so that we can refer to it later uh, in case a similar um, string piece of text needs to be translated. So if I've already translated the car red, and then the car is blue comes in, we want that piece of that previous translation to a translator so they can give, a, they can translate it quicker, they can use the same context, the same tense uh, as a previous translation so it has a uniform look to it. But we do and we can also, we'll charge less money, uh, we'll pay less money to the client and charge less um, um, to the translator. We can reduce software costs. Um, we can reduce the cost that, uh, that the trader, um, uh, that the translation occurs. So a view of our translation memory. For this particular client, we want to match content 20% of the time. So 20% of the time, we had a similar enough string or translation in which aided the translator in the translation they were providing, and we're saving money to the client because of that. And so it ranged from anywhere to, from 20 to 50%. And lately, there's been a decent upward trend um, aside from this last month. Now, a deeper down in the data, we actually see kind of what type of things are occurring here. So, for example, we have close to 3 million words translated. Now, if there were no um, matches being done, we weren't doing that matching to save time and money. It cost 421000 for the translations. Wishing and uh, charging a lower cost um, for that delay we reduce that cost to 321000 so a savings of nearly $100,000 for this 18-month period, $5,500 a month that the SAR can save through our leveraging translation memory. Aspects we're using, um, Looker and Data Exploration for, we're trying to find at-risk customers, those customers who have not logged into the system recently. Um, that would be an indication that the client is not satisfied with SmartLink at the time, so we want to find out if there's an issue there. If they're not utilizing the full benefits of SmartLink, we want to know about that. This is a preemptive way to make sure that a client is satisfied. Um, we also use different financial analysis, um, as we showed in the, um, in the translation memory report. We want to see how is software money, how is providing a benefit to the client. Furthermore, we've cut down on development time. We've done that. Um, before ad hoc queries were done, and each time a business user needed a report, it had to go to a developer to produce that report. Now that we've defined models uh, in Looker, we've been the business users able uh, to access that data without needing development time, and we've provided one view of the data as part of that. Now we're still in our adoption phase, um, but we are proceeding with that. Um, so we now have Looker based by our customer, our customer support, our account managers, sales engineers, product managers, developers, our CEO who developed a report, and even our CEO. Um, we're, we're in adoption, but that's, so far we have a pretty good amount of users who have started using uh, Looker and exploring their own data. One try to do um, further in our weekly release notes where we talk about the products or the new features that we've developed, we'll include interest facts that we've discovered through Looker and through our data exploration. 
And, and so we include that as kind of a, a um, hint or a, um, a way for our end users to get into Looker and uh, discover this data for themselves. And also starting to broadcast this data out so that it's, it's in the office, on a wall board, you can see uh, various metrics um, that we're tracking. So some future plans. So now we put data users in front of our business users. They're only for more reports and more analysis at this point. So we can continue to develop our digital models in Looker to have different metrics that we can look at. Ultimately, we want to expose our data to customers. Now we're focused on our internal business users, but we bring that data to customers in the end where they can view the data as they want and start on their own. And we basically want to do this so that we can show the value that Smartly is providing them. They can see a report that would show them or how is Smartly saving them money. So thank you. Now uh, Scott's going to give a demo of Looker. All right, because the demo, uh, I'm just going to give some context by just kind of giving a high-level overview of what Looker is precisely. Uh, first of all, there's a web application that connects to any relational database, uh, you know, any SQL-compliant database by way of a JDBC connection. Um, having connection to a database, Looker allows users, developers, to, to build a, a data model using our interme intermediate modeling layer, uh, which relies on a a, a, a proprietary language we call LookML, and it's a YAML-based language. Uh, this extracts and simplifies SQL generation. Basically, uh, developers define the relations between tables in LookML. Uh, they introduce Looker to intrinsic columns or attributes within their uh, relational tables, and then they can even build you know, custom metrics or KPIs. Uh, and basically what they're doing is, through LookML, uh, they're, they, you know, writing LookML, they're teaching Looker how to SQL on the fly. Um, Having this, you know, having had a, the Looker analytics team and developers on the customer's end sort of build out a data model in our intermediate layer, uh, business users and you know, people who are interested in doing data exploration have a user-friendly web-based uh, user interface, uh, you know, that they can explore their data with. Uh, three things in my uh, demo of Looker. Uh, first, the explore section, and this is how users go about building queries and, and you know, building queries against the database. Dashboards and visualizing inquiries. Uh, I'll also talk about LookML uh, and embedding SQL, uh, which Smartling makes great use of. Uh, there's actually a, a we have this a derived table, and it's actually common in you know SQL kind of terminology. Uh, but basically, developers can write any sort of SQL they can think of within the modeling layer and exploit that uh, within the explore section. And Smartling makes great use of this, and this is how the translation velocity report was created. Um, and the, if if time, you know, if time, I'd like to show some examples of LookML and, and demonstrate that it's rather expressive and lightweight. Uh, and so they turn out on introducing new KPIs or relations between tables uh, uh, does a lot of time or effort. All right, so I'm going to share my browser. So this is uh, demo.looker.com. This is our demo instance. Uh, and for the demo, I'm actually going to take a look at the look, which is the simulated e-commerce store that we have. Uh, but let me just give you a high overview of what you're seeing here. Uh, there are four main components of Looker, the of which is the Explore section, uh, and this is where users go to do all this ad hoc querying against the database. Within the Explore section, you can have any connection to any number of databases across dialects. So in this case, you know we have uh, five database connections here, uh, and this varies uh, uh, across dialects. Within each database connection, you can have any number of base views. And I'll dive into a base view and explain what is meant by this, but basically it's just a facet of your data or your business uh, that you want to ask and answer your questions. Um, that. second component is dashboards, and this is pretty straightforward. This is just visualizations of, of queries that people have constructed within Looker. So to our business pulse, which is just a, a look at what's been going on in the past 90 days for the simulated e-commerce store, uh, you can have any sorts of you know, visions all within one area. And our visualizations and dashboards also facilitate data exploration, as you'll see within the modeling layer, uh, because you can actually, you know, apply filters which pass through all these uh, these tiles 
And so all your visualizations update, uh, and there's a drill, drilling aspect to any of our visualizations or dashboards. More later. The third one is the looks page, and actually that's the page you're seeing now. These are just analogous to reports. So these are queries that you know, I and my coworkers have built uh, and saved because we want to access them on a regular basis. And you can also click and see you know, what sort of reports your, your coworkers are building and collaborate. And page, you can also manage the, manage the scheduling of email as well as the sharing of any look that you've built within Looker. There's the modeling layer, and I'll go into greater detail uh, after I kind of demonstrate the Explore section. So we'll get a good look at that in just a minute. But first, let me go to the look and to our order items base view really quickly. So this order items base view, and we have our empty or blank query canvas. And so this type of base view is this. Uh, within the modeling layer, we've started from a single table of interest. In this case, it's order items. And so we're going to build, uh, we're going to build queries to answer questions about order items. Items. So in the single table, and we've been in others that relate to it. So for instance, uh, each row represents an individual order item, but an item is associated with a parent order. So we join in the orders uh, SQL table, and all the attributes that reside within that table to sort of slice and dice our queries by. Similar, users place orders, so we can join in the users table and use all the attributes about users. So if I'm interested in seeing you know, fact about order items broken out by demographic or geographic information, this is how I'd go about answering questions like like that. On the end, uh, there are you know an order maps to a product as well as an inventory item, and so we've joined these tables in. All get is is basically a denormalized view of order items, where uh, each row represents an individual order item, and we've joined all these tables, and we have lots of attributes to slice our queries by. Uh, there are two components of a, a, of a query within Looker. Uh, dimensions are basically just columns that are intrinsic to your SQL tables. So for instance, I take uh, order items ID and run this, and basically this is just uh, the primary key of this table. Uh, to also be calculated. So within the modeling layer, developers can write custom SQL or arithmetic between existing uh, dimensions uh, or measures uh, and create custom metrics. So for instance, uh, you know, gross margin percentage is not an intrinsic column, but Looker uh, knows how to build this or construct this metric because a developer or Looker analyst has built this into the modeling layer, so it knows how to write the SQL in order to create this metric on the fly. Okay. If any uh, query within Looker would be a measure, and these are the aggregate functions applied to the above dimensions. Think of this as summing or counting uh, or taking an average of any column uh, within the database or rather, with this base view, any table that has been brought into this base view. I want to from uh, some kind of basic, basic principles and move on up. So I'm going to start with a, a rather basic query here, and I'm just going to do a series of aggregates. So I'm going to take a look at orders count, uh, order items, products, orders, use brands, and categories. So uh, you know, I added these measures to my query canvas, and now I need to run it. Is it's it's uh, you know it's being told that it, you know the user wants to see these aggregate measures. It's going to construct the SQL, send it to the database, and return the result set to the user. I also noticed that when I ran this query up on the left hand side here at the top, uh, it threw up a filter. So what we're seeing is orders, uh, or rather, aggregate results provided that the order uh, was created in the past 30 days. So they originally set up this model, thought it would be a good idea to do this to return recent and relevant results. Um, our date filters are also, you know, they can be changed on the fly. So what we're here is a uh, result set for today and the 29 days prior. Come tomorrow, it will be 20, uh, tomorrow, 29 days prior. We can update this to reflect something else. So something like, uh, suppose I want to see the past 90 days. I can just type in 90 days. So for business or people who don't write SQL on a regular basis, it's rather convenient to use natural language. Uh, and it's very intuitive, too. So if I want to do something like 60 days ago, for 30 days, you can isolate this 30-day block that began 60 days ago, and of course, this will be on a rolling basis. It's relative. Answers have autofill, and in this case, uh, the date filter will uh, kind of give us some some on what we can do, uh, you know, what we can apply as a filter. So this query, I'm just going to stick to this month. So this, there have been 15, uh, 15 uh, roughly 1,500 items representing 1,400 products. This amount came from uh, 895 orders made by 798 users. This represents 666 brands and 26 categories. 
kind of break this out by some dimension. Uh, this is basically just group by in, in SQL. So uh, suppose I want to see how this differs uh, over some geographic uh, attribute. Let's take a look at user state. Associated with the largest number of orders or order, uh, order items or products. We have any dimension or measure by just clicking on its name. So if I want to just uh, you know sort this alphabetically by state, I can do so. I can choose uh, you know how about orders count and see which state is associated with the largest number of orders added that the order was placed this month. We see California. So I want to isolate California and maybe build a report around this. I click on California, and what it'll do is it'll actually throw up uh, that value into a filter for me, such that any subsequent query that I run with in Looker will be limited to uh, you know orders created this month, provided that the user who placed that order was in California. Until I alter this uh, filter at the top, go ahead and remove the state because we're always talking about California. And now I want to break this out by uh, time. So I have two ways of doing that. Because I want to break it up at the day level, I can go to the filter, which is already in my query canvas, and add this to the table. Alternatively, I can just go to the left-hand panel where all my dimensions and measures reside, and I could just search for it. So I want to see created date, order created date, and I'll add this to my uh, query run, run it. All sorts in ascend order. There we go. To spike, um, or you know, let me filter this and see which day is associated with the largest number of orders. I see that it was May. Uh, pardon me. Yeah, May twentieth. Uh, so suppose I actually see what's driving this. Uh, Looker is all about facilitating data exploration, uh, and this is uh, allowing users to drill into the raw data. So um, any count within Looker is drillable. I just want to see the 13 categories represented by these uh, 10 orders on the uh, 20th of May, I can simply click on that 13, and I'm taking this user-defined drill set. So the value of the, of the count was 13. Intuitively, when I'm taken into this new window, I'm going to see 13 rows that represents, each row represents the value uh, uh, values captured by that, that count. So categories represented here results that we have 13 rows with each category there. And we have measures or dimensions that the analyst or developer uh, thought would be intuitive for the user to see whenever, whenever they click on, on accounts. These results are not static, though. I can always update them. So suppose that I wanted to add gross margin to this. Um, I can just add, add gross margin and rerun this. That looker uh, isn't moving your data. Uh, it's actually piecing together SQL and that against the database and returning it for you. So uh, I'll actually jump over to this query SQL tab here, demonstrate the necessary SQL one would have to write in order to reproduce this query by hand. Uh, pretty quickly, things can get uh, in, intense. So you, you see that uh, there's a, potentially a lot of value added where uh, uh, you're in, if you're in a case where uh, you know analysts are getting requests from business users to get you know certain data, uh, now I've actually empowered, or rather Looker empowers you know business user analysts to go actually go out and ask the questions themselves and have to write the SQL, which could be rather tedious. I want to uh, demonstrate our ability to pivot within the uh, user interface because it's rather uh, useful. Uh, and I'll transition to visualizations and lastly the modeling layer. So I'm going to do this query and start again. I want to actually ask the question, or rather to the question, how do users behave uh, with respect to their ordering depending on the month in which they signed up? So this is a rather straightforward analysis. This is just a cohort analysis. Um, to do it in Looker, it's actually fairly trivial. So I'll take a look at a couple of time attributes. I want to see order created month. And apply a filter here. I want to see the user created month. Match on this one as well. And then I see the number of users who placed orders and the corresponding number of orders for the past eight months. Hide the left-hand panel, and I can sort these so they're a little bit more uh, intuitive here. Full set is what we might get in SQL. What we have is every pairwise combination between created month and subsequent order created month. We have the number of users who placed those orders. It might be a bit easier to actually uh, kind of consume this data if each cohort was represented by its own row. And to do that within Looker, all we have to do is pivot one of these time attributes. And in this case, I'll choose ordered month. I'll pivot it, rerun this query. And now a kind of easy to consume matrix or, or tabular result set where each row represents the cohort 
inhibited time dimension represents their subsequent behavior with respect to ordering. That, that for those who signed up in October of 2013, 18 users placed one or more orders in that same month based on this pivoted time dimension, and we see that they placed 90 orders. Of that cohort who signed up back in October of 2013, 130 users placed one or more orders in the following month based on the time dimension pivoted here, and we see they placed 148 orders. In the same way, and then we have some null values here for the follow, you know, for subsequent rows indicating that you know, you know cohort up in uh, November or December could have placed orders in the in the month before they signed up. Uh, we can always add stuff to this. So suppose that I want to see uh, you know profit per user, I could run this, and now I've just updated my result set to you know have the metric, and we can look at the value of these customers that have really you know that are basically our strong repeat customers. Again, also drill in. So if I wanted to see who these these uh, these customers are, I actually click that 43, and I have this user-defined drill set. So now I have a list of our, of our most uh, you know, loyal customers, and perhaps I can do some further further analysis and glean some insights about uh, you know, attributes about these users uh, who you know return to the store uh, often. Let me demonstrate creating a visualization in Looker. It's rather straightforward. All one to do is you know, construct worry of interest, and then jump over to our visualize tab. Well, I'm actually just going to build a bar chart of orders by state, something rather simple here. So I do uh, orders. How about I'm going to break this out by user state. So here's the set. Uh, it's actually for the past 30 days. That's fine. I'll leave it as is. Uh, we can see California is the top state with respect to the number of orders, uh, whereas Nevada is the top state with respect to average gross margin, but we're talking about two orders here. Anyway, let me sort this. Uh, so suppose visualize this. Um, here's that SQL tab. So this is the query generated by Looker. And then if I jump over to this Visualize tab, I can just choose the most appropriate visualization for this particular query that I've built. So we have area charts. Bar chart might be very appropriate for this one. And this is actually kind of uh, how uh, the SmartLink went about uh, visualizing their translation velocity. So all, all the developer had to do was come up with a way to measure translation velocity, which would appear as a me measure. And they brought it out by client uh, and then visualized it uh, just using this visualization tab. We have column uh, line charts in the event that you want to do a time series, charts, pie, and, and tables as well single value in the event that your result set is just a, a measure with uh, perhaps some filters applied. So we did just a collection of these visualizations. So uh, analysts, developers, and business users have, have gone around querying, uh, identifying you know, result sets that they want to see on a regular basis. They can see them as looks. Or they can add them to their da dashboard. So I'm going to return to this business pulse, which is just a collection of these visualizations. So in the uh, pardon me, 90 days, we can see that in this uh, simulated e-commerce store, there have been about 3,100 total orders with an associated average order profit of $55, and we have you know 1,000 first-time purchasers. Again, Looker is that much like its tabular result sets, you can fill in. So if you're in a time series and you see a spike or perhaps a, a big dip, uh, and you, you know you, you want to see what's going on beneath the scene, you can always drill in. If I want to see the seven sweaters that sold back on uh, March 26, I can click on that seven and I'm this user defined drill set. Goes in between queries is as simple as using the back button, so that's very convenient. And visualizations too. So we have uh, you know geographic uh, geographic plotting, so we can have you know uh, uh, zip represented, and again we can drill in and see the order items or orders associated with any given zip code. Uh, Donut charts, and there's that actually uh, any dimension definition can include embedded HTML. So notice that from this sync board we have a brand name. It's just the top 10 brands for the past 90 days with respect to various met metrics here. Suppose to see a summary about our top brand. This little spark line to the right will actually jump me to a new dashboard and automatically apply the filter uh, Allegra K. Uh, rather, uh, within the name filter, it will pass the parameter Allegra K for me, uh, and this defaults to uh, orders in the past 30 days. And basically, I have a summary of that brand for the past 90 days. Again, I can demonstrate it with uh, Calvin Klein. 
this uh, in other def definitions of dimensions. So actually, if I return to this result set, um, where on order items, we have a user history field. And so this is not an intrinsic column in the table. Rather, uh, what it does is it jumps us to uh, the orders base view and automatically applies a filter uh, that maps to the user that I was clicking on. So I clicked on uh, an order item associated with Jasmine. Uh, I wanted to see her complete order history. I click on that order history and I jump to the order space view and then a filter is applied for me. We can with the items. Actually, you can get quite creative with this. So I think this to transition to our base view, uh, rather our modeling layer. So uh, I'm going to model section. I'm actually going to jump into developer mode here. And then I'm going to go to the look model, which was what we were playing in. So two primary file types to, uh, that we focus on when we're developing a model. Uh, there's the model.lookml file. Uh, and this is where all the joins are made explicit, such that Looker knows how to you know, uh, piece together uh, joins on the fly when users are calling from various tables. The second type is a view file, uh, and this maps directly to uh, the SQL table. So for instance, the order.view file has all these dimensions, which basically map to the intrinsic columns in the table. Uh, but you notice that I have embedded SQL within this file. Uh, there's also arithmetic between existing dimensions. This is how uh, uh, you know, developers and analysts can sort of uh, embellish the, the default model. That is, they can, you know, in intrinsic columns and then build upon those. Such that uh, while users are exploring in the user section, uh, they can use all these custom metrics that may be pieced together for complex SQL, but they'd be unaware uh, uh, that it's actually doing that for them. It's a model file. Uh, and I just want to walk through the definition of a base view. We have an SQL example as well. So just uh, turn your attention to line 10 here. We're just declaring a new base view. Uh, so actually, I'm going to go back to between the SQL and the lookML. Basically, when we declare a base view inventory items, this is the table made reference to in a from clause in a select statement. Um, we're going to be able to select any sort of combination of dimension and measures from the base table, as well as any tables that we join in. But that's beyond the scope of this call, uh, or of this webinar, pardon me. Next line is just uh, declaring a, a list of joins. So I'm going to join in the following tables, the first of which is, which is products. And then all I do is make reference to the form key in the table, uh, in the base table. So basically, implicitly, what this implicitly is doing is it's mapping the foreign key within the, uh, the image items table, uh, and it's setting it equal to the product uh, ID, or the primary key of the table that we're joining in. There are other custom join types uh, that Looker has, but uh, Looker really plays well with uh, data stored in third normal form, and by default, we're, we're talking about joins here, uh, but the high level of custom, you know, you can customize any sort of join here. So we have SQL on arguments, where we can, uh, you know, specify shared columns or conditional, like, conditional joins in the event that you have, like, polymorphic tables. Uh, and we also have just the ability to write custom SQL here. And so now you can really just write any sort of uh, SQL that comes to mind. So you can do joins, full outer joins, uh, with all sorts of interesting uh, uh, conditional or join logic. And below, this SQL is basically, or yes, this SQL is basically kind of what when we declare a base view. So we're selecting dimensions and measures from uh, the combination of tables that we've joined in. Base view itself is the table in the from clause. Joining in our left join, so winning in products. The foreign key maps uh, the foreign key in the uh, base table to the primary key of the table that we're joining in. And then in uh, square brackets, I have all these optional uh, SQL clauses. So a where uh, and a having clause uh, map to filters uh, within the explore section. Uh, and a group by would be just a dimension in the event that you have a combination of dimensions and measures. And an order by just you know click on the dimension uh, or measure name. I'm going to do orders. Oh, I should comment this out. I'm going to do this view file and again, kind of just quickly go over uh, uh, what makes uh, you know a view file or a base view. Um, so base view has to make reference to a view file, uh, and a view file will map directly to an intrinsic SQL table. But they could also be a derived table, which uh, actually is beyond the scope of this uh, webinar. Um, but basically, it's a, a, a it's analogous to a materialized view or some sort of 
come SQL that you're writing on the fly, uh, and it's you know transforming your data into some um, one exploit. Uh, anyway, I'll let that. Anyway, so a, a dimension basically maps to a come in the table. So in this case, there's a primary key of our orders table. It's the ID, and so we're going to bring this in, or rather make reference to that table uh, or that column in that table by just declaring a dimension ID. It's the primary key, so we're saying primary key is true. And specify the data type. So in this case, the, the primary key is integer. And there's this SQL uh, argument. And what passing as a parameter is basically what I kind of say is like a handshake between looker and data. So what we're saying is whenever a user calls uh, the orders ID within the explore section, uh, look to the length table, in this case it's orders, and look to the column ID and knows uh, which data to kind of pull in in, in displays or whenever they're poking around and, and choosing various dimensions. Uh, this created, uh, created time attribute. In this case, we're looking to the orders table and the created at uh, date time field. Uh, it's actually interesting. What we're doing is we're creating a number of uh, dimensions kind of in a bulk process. What we're doing is we're actually extracting various time attributes from the single date time or uh, time stamp. Uh, so we're at the created time the created date, the created week, the month, the month number, year, and the date week number, all from this single time attribute, we can kind of parse out these, uh, these uh, uh, how would I say, these, these other aspects, these other attributes of time. So there's license dice of data by. So we're to see the number of uh, orders at the week or month level or by day of, uh, day of week, we can do that with this single, really. Also, uh, we have embedded SQL. So, for instance, total amount of order uh, in U.S. dollars. Uh, this is not a, a, a attribute that resides uh, or that is intrinsic to this orders table. Uh, it's actually calculated by doing a correlated subselect between the orders table and the order items table. So, basically, we're summing up the order item sale price, provided that the order ID uh, in the order items table is equal to the orders uh, ID. So, um, not SQL dialects have this capability, and you'll notice that uh, Looker actually plays well with all sorts of dialects. So you can write SQL uh, that is dialect specific. So uh, in the event that you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a PSQL or something along those lines, you can utilize uh, or TL. You can utilize like window functions or something along those lines. If you have MySQL, uh, you can utilize correlated subselects and all that great stuff. And this is all specified within the admin panel. When you make a connection to a database, you specify the dialect. Uh, and it's that simple. So I'll wrap it up for the uh, the demo and a transition to a Q&A. So I'm going to stop sharing my browser. And I'll just return to my slides here. All right. So we have some questions here. Um, we're able to share dashboards or data with people who don't have a Looker login. Uh, we do have ability to share uh, dashboards and queries, uh, tabular results sets with people who do not have a Looker login. Um, I did not demonstrate that in the demo, uh, and a, a rather important component of Looker. Uh, scheduled emails, uh, or scheduled looks rather, uh, you can email out uh, tabular results sets. You can also send out uh, Data files or entire dashboards, and we also have uh, read-only dashboards or embedded iframes to present visualizations to people who do not have a Looker login. Uh, we also have an API, so uh, we have a number of ways of, of getting Looker out. I mean, sorry, data outside of Looker and getting it, uh, you know, uh, into any sort of in dashboarding system you have. And we also have integration with Google Docs and Excel spreadsheets, so you can actually take a public look or a public save query uh, and kind of pipe to a spreadsheet. Uh, and then that spreadsheet around. And the great thing about that is that uh, that result set is actually uh, based live query against the database. So you can, uh, it will reflect new data as that data has changed on the database. All right. I have a question for Greg. Um, he covered this, but I think maybe he can speak more to it. Uh, Greg, what is your infrastructure or, uh, or database? Do you have any other systems connecting to Looker? No, it is uh, simply Redshift. Uh, we could bring in our MySQL transactional, but pretty much um, 
a data copy once a day to Redshift and use liquor off of that. All right. Um, do Looker's documenta does Looker's documentation or reference guide users to refine data intake and anal analysis, i.e., what are noises and what are early warning? I don't think I understand that question. Um, if, if that was your, uh, if you asked that question, um, what are noises and what are early warning? Uh, if so, how? Uh, if you would elaborate on that question, I'll, I could circle back to that one. We also have a question, how does Looker de uh, deal with non-relational data? Um, so, you know, like we can talk like NoQL. Um, Looker is first and foremost like a, you know, a, a tool for relational databases. So it's basically all SQL compliant databases. Um, however, we recognize the importance of uh, uh, NoQL. It's actually, you know, they're important in this day and age. And so we're working on builds uh, for Impa, uh, Spark, or Shark. And so these will be basically HiveQL. Uh, we're looking for engines that you know uh, increase query performance for uh, HiveQL. So we build, and we don't have customers on it right now. We're still in the kind of the development phase, phase and testing it because we want to make sure that it's as performant as our relational uh, solution. Okay. Um, I speak to this, and I think Greg will be able to speak to this one as well. What kind of training is required for this type of analytics? Um, uh, well, the answer is it depends. So, uh, you know, users who are using, you're predominantly just using the Explore section as well as dashboards, um, they just have to be data curious. Uh, they don't have to have a, a, a superb understanding, or if an, actually rather any understanding of SQL or relational databases. They just have to, you know, have questions in mind and have the curiosity to sort of answer them and poke around and put queries within the Explore section. From a standpoint, um, we like to identify someone uh, who can own the model, uh, and that typically is someone who has experience with, with SQL. So they're DAs, they're developers, they're analysts uh, or data scientists who all, you know, all of whom write SQL on a regular basis. Um, managed by people who aren't SQL experts, look at itself an abstraction of SQL, and so it, it, it's best if one has an understanding of SQL going into, uh, you know, development in Looker. I don't know if you can you know, add to that, Greg, if you have any perspective on it. Uh, i say that we did our training much how you described. We had a, a couple developers, and they received the handle modeling layer, and they did all of the defining of models. And, and our end business users, they weren't involved in the model creation, but we did a number of training sessions just to kind of be familiar with Looker, how to use it. Excellent. Um, how can I incorporate Looker into existing web app? Uh, and, and in parens, we have ASP.NET. Uh, so Looker have an API, uh, and we have a number of SDKs. Uh, we have Ruby, Python, Node.js, uh, and we also have an R package. Uh, but basically, you can utilize the, uh, the API to sort of, uh, you know, query existing data model uh, and take, you know, uh, result sets, and they'll be, they'll be JSON blobs. Uh, and present that however you like within your application. We have a number of clients that uh, do that. Uh, it's, it's kind of one component of how they use Looker. Uh, and we have a couple of clients that rely entirely on uh, the Looker data model in conjunction with the, the use of the API. Uh, and, and they get a great deal of value out of it, and they actually don't use the Explore set all that much. It's actually rather interesting. So we see uh, different kind of configurations or use cases for Looker. Act data in uh, SQL Server, uh, Windows Azure. Um, yes, yes. Any SQL compliant or relational database uh, that can, you know, by way of a JDBC driver, we can handle. And actually, uh, we use, we connect to MSSQL or, or, you know, SQL Server all, all the time. Let's see other questions. Uh, so th that first question about uh, uh, Looker documentation, and I was not quite clear on the question, but I'll, you know, going off the first half of the sentence, do you have Looker documentation or guides for users? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, within within Looker, the Looker instance itself, there's a a a, a link to the doc section 
uh, and the docs section is, is an entire site on getting this users uh, and analysts or differs up to speed um, either in data in the explore section and, and creating dashboards or developer kind of path you know how to get up to speed developing in look ML. a reference section for uh, you know PI uh, operations and security uh, drive tables and then just a, a kind of a look ML or dashboards reference section. And lastly, a video library, which is actually really important. In the event you learn visually, uh, we have a, a, a solid uh, uh, kind of training section for our video library. OK, this is the last question. How does it take to implement? That's a good question. Um, it depends. Uh, so it depends on the complexity of the data. It depends on uh, how much ownership did on your end uh, take uh, you went out the model. With that, I actually work on the implementation team. So uh, my job is to sort of build out and deliver a model that is very much workable to the client. Um, and again, that it varies on how long that, that takes. With that said, um, Looker generates a, a great deal of the model uh, itself or programmatically. So um, uh, I'm actually not sharing my browser anymore, but there is a section where you can actually just generate a new model. And what Generator does is it. It takes a view of the database that we're connected to, uh, all the tables that are within that database, and generate individ individual view files uh, for each of those SQL tables. It will apply all of the intrinsic columns in that table and enter them as dimensions. So all, that, all the lines of code that, where we were declaring dimensions, um, unless it's a calculated dimension, that is all done programmatically at the outset of a, a trial or implementation. Um, and then actually Looker is smart enough to do a lot of the joins uh, and the create base views uh, by itself. So for that uh, foreign and primary keys are main, uh, named intuitively, and there aren't like table prefixes, prefixes in the event that you have a, you know, like Joe or something along those lines. Uh, our generator is smart enough to actually make these joins and declare these base views for you. So quite, uh, we actually just you know spin up an instance or uh, uh, you know spin an instance of Looker, generate a model once the database has been connected to, uh, and users have actually a rather workable model that they can use uh, right out of the gate. Eight. And then Looker Analytics team, as well as the you know developers on the client side, they just take ownership of updating the model and adding any custom metrics that, that users want uh, to see when they're exploring the data. I think that's it. Um, so uh, I'm going to pass it back to Shannon. And, uh, thank you all for your time. Perfect. Greg and Scott, thank you so much for this. Uh, webinar and the information education and the demo of uh, the product. Uh, always good to get some demos in for our subscribers. And thanks, of course, to all our attendees who always submit and are so engaged in submitting uh, some great questions for our speakers. Hope everyone has a great day. And just a reminder, as uh, everyone, that we will get a copy, uh, send a follow-up email for the webinar within two business days. So for this webinar, by end of day Monday, with links to the slides, links to the recording, and additional information so you can uh, take a look at Looker yourselves and the, what they're doing. Hope it has a great day, and thanks again for your time. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, Scott, to, for, and again, for a great presentation.